Thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, so hopefully I'm covering uh, uh, all of coagulation, anticoagulation, and I've tried to kind of put in some of the answers to some of the questions that we've had um, given to us as a bit of a warm up as well. Um, so it, ho they're looking at the audience as kind of all levels of people, so um, I'm hoping to kind of um, explain um, some basic stuff and then some more advanced stuff as well. Okay, um, an outline of the presentation. Um, I specialise in venous thrombosis. Um, obviously, anticoagulation is used in atrial fibrillation and arterial thrombosis as well, but that's not an area that I would um, see patients, but I've covered that as well. And then I've covered a few specific anticoagulation medications that are available that I think are, are kind of interesting to know about. Um, okay. So the reason thrombosis is important, um, a main aim with thrombosis is to try and prevent thrombosis rather than be the other end treating it. Um, and thrombosis causes a lot of mortality, morbidity, um, and so it's just trying to streamline the best and most effective way of doing that. Um, so why do we get thrombosis? Um, this has been around for you know, 100 years plus. Um, we've got to look at the pressure on the venous system. Um, the surgeons are cutting open the endothelium, so any damage, trauma to the endothelium. And you've also got people with hypercoagulable states. Um, so we've got cancer, we've got thrombophilia, um, pregnancy, estrogen therapy, all those kind of things are going to make an impact to the risk of thrombosis. So we've got to try and address all of those specific areas. Um, I just, um, I'm sure everyone knows what a pulmonary embolism and a DVT is, but um, so the veins um, in the leg um, would occur with a deep vein thrombosis, and there's also a superficial vein thrombosis, which is slightly different treatment. And those thrombosis have the possibility of going up to the pulmonary artery, causing severe pain and blocking um, the supply to the lungs. So that's what we're trying to um, avoid or treat as required. Um, so when I see patients with venous thrombosis in the clinic, the most important thing for that patient is, is this venous thrombosis completely out of the blue? Um, or is it a provoked post, for example, post-surgery thrombosis? So those are the two most differentiating factors that I'm trying to determine from the history. Um, so if a patient's had surgery and they've got a good reason why they've got a thrombosis, then we feel reasonably comfortable about stopping their anticoagulation afterwards. If they've had a thrombosis completely out of the blue, or usually someone says, oh, I had a bit of an ache or something like that, then, you know, that happened for no particular good reason, so that would make you more consider long-term anticoagulation. So, um, and some people have ongoing risk factors like cancer. So we all see quite a lot of patients with cancer and thrombosis. And that's a difficult one because if they were having ongoing cancer treatment or um, a diagnosis of cancer, then their risk is going to still be higher. Um, so looking, and this is a paper from a long time ago, um, 2003, but things haven't really changed since then. If you get a post-operative deep vein thrombosis, then you're very unlikely to have a reoccurring event. If you get a medical, non-surgical trigger, then there's a small um, background risk of a reoccurring event. And if it's unprovoked, the risk is really high. So kind of roughly quote about 10% per year to patients. And um, because anticoagulation now is felt to be reasonably safe for the majority of patients, I kind of say to my patients, well, I think there's more advantage for you to be in on anticoagulation than not in that situation. Um, so um, we get asked a lot about aspirin um, because aspirin is very easy to take, um, it's very easy to prescribe, it doesn't um, felt to be reasonably safe. And so this is a study where patients with um, unprovoked thrombosis, they stopped their anticoagulation and they went on to aspirin afterwards to see whether that was beneficial. And the risk of reoccurring events was pretty similar. 
but there was a reduction in major vascular events. So we seem to be, by giving patient, aspirin to those patients, we seem to be reducing their risk of arterial thrombosis. Because once they've had a thrombosis, they're probably at risk of arterial and venous thrombosis. So we seem to be slightly improving the risk of vascular events but in not making any significant impact into their risk of venous thrombosis reoccurrence. Um, and that's been um, looked at in a number of studies as well, and it's felt to be that aspirin is probably slightly better, um, but uh, slightly more bleeding. Um, but there's no doubt that if you suspect that someone's got a high risk of reoccurring thrombosis, that actually you, they need anticoagulation, they don't need aspirin. So I think aspirin is a considered um, medication, but I think if they've got a reoccurring event, then warfarin or um, a DIRC is better. Um, so this is um, a really helpful tool that I presented to GPs in the UK. So a lot of our referrals to thrombosis clinic are patients who want to stop anticoagulation and don't um, don't want to be on lifelong anticoagulation and we get some quite young patients who the thought of taking medication for the rest of their life is is quite sort of daunting so this is just a risk score um, on the risk of them having a reoccurring event so um, unfortunately if you're male your reoccurrence risk is much higher so you'll double the female risk um, so this is what I would suggest to a patient if I felt it was reasonable to stop anticoagulation that we check a D-dimer a month after stopping the anticoagulation. Um, and then we can put all those figures into a score and come out with an annual risk of thrombosis. So um, you're going to, and there's various scoring systems around this, but this is probably the most commonly used. And the D-dimer months post-stopping anticoagulation and these are not in the provoked thrombosis these are in patients who've had thrombosis for no particular reason is quite a significant impact onto their reoccurring event and mostly i would say it's negative so which are kind of like you know well that's okay but the the problem is if it's positive then i'm probably going to suggest that the patient has lifelong anticoagulation so they have to be slightly prepared for that for that factor and if you have a thrombosis with hormonal therapy or pregnancy, then you score a negative, you, you take off two, so that reduces your risk significantly. Um, so there's a little bit about prevention of hospital-associated venous thrombosis. And coming to Wellington from the UK, the UK is very streamlined in the national guidance about thromboprophylaxis in all patients in the hospital. And it seems like you walk through the door and you get anticoagulation as soon as you come through. Um, it's not quite so... Um, um, it's not quite so regimented in New Zealand. And, um, you know, which... Um, maybe we're overdoing it in America and the UK. Maybe we're just putting these patients um, on lots of anticoagulation, which is unnecessary. But it, it's also, we don't seem to risk assess patients as they walk through the door. It's not quite... So we probably should be risk assessing patients. And then based on that risk score, particularly picking up the high-risk patients to give them thromboprophylaxis. So... Um, so most of the patients on our ward are cancer patients, so we instantly have a higher risk population in haematology. Um, and as soon as they come through the door, because they're immobile, because they're having surgery, whatever, they're going to be at risk of thrombosis. So we're working on, we're, that's work in progress in Wellington. Um, there's certain types of score, um, because there's a little bit of a when I came to New Zealand, there's a little bit of disbelief that thromboprophylaxis is, um, um, is appropriate for all patients, which it probably isn't appropriate for all patients, but it's trying to pick up the patients that are particularly high risk that should be on something. So um, just looking at um, some of the scores, this is a, um, a post-operative um, score for non-orthopedic surgical patients. And... Um, you can see there's a various number of risk factors and you score various number of points for. But when we look at the actual scores that people are scoring, there's 11% risk of thrombosis in these patients um, with a score over eight. So we probably should certainly be thromboprophylaxing an element of patients. And I'm not saying it isn't being done in Wellington, it's just that we're not doing it very systematically. Um, 
And in medical patients, because they're a little bit the unknown and there is a bit of a lack of evidence in, in what we should be doing with these patients. So there's an other risk assessment scores again, um, you know, for various patients. Um, and also bleeding tools, because we'd also, um, you don't want to give patients a high risk of bleeding, kind of thromboprophylaxis. So you kind of got scoring systems where you can kind of, we need a simple tick chart for the junior doctors that, you know, um, it's relatively straightforward. Um, and there's all kinds of um, things there. So looking at 15,000 patients um, in medical patients in the IMPROVE study, um, if you've got high risk, your risk of thrombosis is about 8 to 11 percent, and we probably potentially should be thromboprophylaxing those patients just to try and reduce the risk. And there are certainly low risk patients that probably don't need thromboprophylaxis. Um, so what we did over the last year or so is we picked up all the thrombosis patients that presented to Wellington Hospital to see whether we were having a significant problem. And um, it's not a significant amount of medical admissions that we're having. I need to kind of look at the number of medical admissions in the year, but we only picked up 29 medical admissions who had a thrombosis and 34 surgical patients with thrombosis. So it doesn't seem a, um, you know, a massive problem, but we're working on that side of things. Um, just a bit about stockings. I know it's pharma, it probably don't supply stockings, but um, the evidence for stockings has kind of gone, it used to be that everyone got stockings, but it's now kind of not so favourable. There's been a lot of um, post-stroke studies that have suggested that actually probably they're detrimental to patients because they're actually digging in and causing venous ulceration. So um, it's not advocated for all patient stockings, but we certainly do have patients with post-thrombotic syndrome that some patients find stockings helpful. And we ha they should be specifically measured because the problem is if they're too loose, they don't work. If they're too tight, they just dig in and cut off the circulation. So I think um, stockings for everyone is probably a little bit out, but I think there are specific patients that might benefit from that. Okay. Um, so just covering coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, I don't specialise in this and I don't see any, or I see minimal patients with this, so um, I'm certainly not an expert in this. There's a lot of different drugs that are going to attack um, the risk of um, platelet thrombosis in arteries. And um, you can see the common drugs there and, and the common um, pathways there and you're probably much more familiar with them. But this is the one that probably latterly people are focusing on the, the thrombin. And um, so um, this is a um, different. So we're probably um, going to see a new wave of cardiologists. Cardiologists in, in a hematology perspective never want their patients to clot and are accepting bleeding risk. You know, kind of probably um, they'll manage bleeding in that patient, um, particularly if they're putting stents in or they're doing work on their patients. Um, so we've got a large study, a double blind study, 27,000 patients um, who had stable atherosclerosis vascular disease. And we're always trying to combine anticoagulants um, and warfarin combined with aspirin has been quite a high risk strategy and quite a lot of bleeding problems. Um, so we've now combined riboxaban um, with aspirin um, to see whether that is improving cardiovascular disease. So I suspect that there's going to be a new wave of um, aspirin and NOAC therapy. And looking at this um, study, um, there's a significant advantage to giving rivoxaban and aspirin on the outcome of the cardiology patient. Um, whilst there's a slightly increased risk of bleeding, that was uh, outweighed by the um, by um, the mortality reduction of the cardiovascular disease. So um, this is a big study um, slide with lots of uh, um, stuff on, but if you look at the net clinical um, benefit, you're treating an awful lot of patients with quite an expensive medication, but there is a reduction um, in death, stroke, and myocardial infarction without a significant impact on you know, fatal bleeding. So I suspect that that might be a you know, high-risk strategy that the cardiologist might adopt in certain patient populations. And I'm certainly not advocating this, 
but I think there's probably going to be a cardiology um, wave of this um, changing practice. Um, atrial fibrillation, um, very common. Um, and this is the fibrillation, and, and it's not effective kind of um, cardiac um, function. It's kind of just fibrillating, shaking, and therefore there's a risk of thrombosis um, occurring. And the real worry is the risk of stroke. And um, um, so um, in atrial fibrillation, there's quite a lot of medication that you, options that you can choose for atrial fibrillation. Um, obviously, New Zealand's got you know, vast experience with the bigger trend, much more than the UK. Um, and so I think you know, that familiarity and that kind of knowing a drug is kind of you know, really helpful in that situation. So the higher dose of dabigatran is probably the one that stands out for the least, the most reduction in stroke, but then there's slightly um, more side effects and slightly increased bleeding in that, that situation. So um, there are other, certainly other combinations that can be used. Um, so when we're um, assessing all our patients, you know, particularly the bridging patients, we would always do a Chad Vascal just to see what their risk is of um, events. And um, I mean, these rates are per year, but if you think of the rate per day, it's actually probably quite minimal. So we're probably quite safe in majority of patients that we're trying to bridge, stopping that for a few days before their surgery. So the risk per day is kind of minimal. But certainly, um, you know, when their scores get high, we would certainly consider bridging in the high-risk patients. Um, and then, you know, it's quite helpful, the has blood score, if you're worried about, you know, somebody who's long-term long anticoagulation, trying to give you an idea of their bleeding risk. Um, and, you know, certainly sort of, it's quite nice to give a figure to patients, say, well, you can have anticoagulation, your bleeding risk, you know, over a, a series of years is this. Um, and I always find it <coughs> nerve-wracking when we have elderly patients who fall over a lot, kind of, um, but they have a very high Chad score and, and try to balance the risks and the benefits. Um, so, uh, kind of just finishing um, up, you know, the you've got to decide when you're considering anticoagulation what that patient wants and what risks they're accepting you know and you know if you're a pretty sedentary person and well controlled and whatever anticoagulation you're on you probably accept um, being on lifetime anticoagulation it's the young patients who want to go surfing or do reckless things with their life um, that don't really want to be on anti long-term anticoagulants and they're probably willing to accept a higher risk um, in that situation. So it is very individualised and there's no kind of, you know, can't persuade people to have lifelong anticoagulation just because I think it would be good for them. Um, so just some specifics about um, certain anticoagulation medication that I thought might be helpful um, from my point of view. Um, and also I was asked to do a lot about the different um, oral anticoagulation, uh, oral anticoagulants. Um, so dabigatran, um, obviously the majority of patients in New Zealand are on dabigatran, um, which um, is you know, a very good drug. And I think um, having moved over to New Zealand, I've got a lot more experience about dabigatran than I had in the UK, because it was probably one of those ones that we didn't use. Um, the advantages of the other or oral anticoagulants is um, when people get thrombosis, you can put them straight on it. You don't need to give them clexane beforehand. So a lot of hospitals in the UK have adopted going straight on rivoxaban because of ease and not having to inject patients. Um, and apixaban has some attractions because of the renal failure patients um, and probably slightly um, better bleeding rates. So um, I wouldn't say the bigger trend has kind of featured um, in the sort of vast proportion of the UK patients. Um, what changed my practice about probably about a year or two ago was the um, reversal agent and antidote being available because, um, you know, patients have a choice and, um, you know, having the perfect um, reversal agent available is quite attractive from that point of view. And a lot of patients worry about the risk of bleeding on these um, drugs. So um, 
So I think, um, you know, Tobigatran has a great attraction because of the instant reversal agent, and it's not pro-thrombotic. So if we have a warfarin patient who's over anticoagulation, I, I give them a lot of clotting factors, and I do reverse their anticoagulation, but I give them a lot of clotting drugs that make them pro-thrombotic during that period. Whereas in Dibigatran, I just neutralize the drug. I don't make them thrombotic. I don't increase their thrombotic tendency. So it is the absolute kind of bee's knees when it comes to reversal agents. Um, Pixabam is less renally excreted. So um, it has the kind of attraction in renal disease patients and goes to a slightly lower GFR um, based on the trial data. Um, so that one was well to be probably our preference in renal failure patients. And um, Rivoxaban, no one can quite explain why they have a once daily dosing when they don't have any difference in their you know, half-life, but they do once daily dosing. Um, but looking at their half-life, it's not actually that much different than the other anticoagulants, but it seems to be effective. So um, some patients prefer that side of things. Um, so a bit of practical kind of experience and covering some of the questions that we got um, given before here. Um, so um, um, can diets be taken with meals? Um, so that seems um, you know, relatively straightforward. It's not affected by food like warfarin would be um, necessarily. Um, Dibigatran can't be taken out of its capsule. So the others have the advantage that you can um, take it out of the capsule and you can mix it in with food. I don't know whether that would be a huge advantage, but certain patients that it might be advantageous for. Um, certainly, seeing a lot of dibigatran in the last six months, people seem to get um, indigestion with dibigatran. So there's probably a 10% of patients who get um, a bit of indigestion with dibigatran. And, um, we don't see we don't have a good alternative to give them in that situation apart from warfarin um which um you know can be fine um so we tend to kind of persevere with the bigger trend and say oh i think it you know probably will settle down but it can be a continual problem and certainly we've had patients that you know we've had to switch anticoagulation for um the dental work, um, some evidence came out a while ago from the dental physicians that warfarin, you could probably go straight through and do dental surgery on warfarin. Um, and certainly the same has been issued for Dorex as well. I think it depends on how comfortable the dentist is and what they're on the specific anticoagulant for. If it's a low risk, you know, atrial fibrillation, you know, which is low risk. If they feel more comfortable, then you know you could stop the anticoagulants the day before. Um, it, you know, it it should, but it, the data says that we probably don't need to, um, and we could give some tranexamic acid at the time that they do dental surgery. Um, we don't advocate the Dorax in heart valves, and that's because the study stopped preliminary um, because it was felt to be dangerous. So the studies closed on the patients on metal heart valves. Um, and I don't see that changing over time. Um, it may be that the tissue valves are, are slightly less risky, but um, I think that's probably unlikely to change. <coughs> so um, they do need bleeding, and they do need bleeding from time to time just to check their renal function. Um, just um, to know, and um, there is always a case that people end up in hospital probably an elderly patient um, who's ill for other reasons and ends up with renal failure and then ends up bleeding, kind of coming in. Um, so people need to be aware that um, it kind of needs to be addressed in that situation. Um, so we probably would check the blood tests every six or 12 months, um, or if they're unwell, just to pick up any renal failure. Um, and just um, renal failure is a big um, issue because um, there's not many patients probably with renal failure, but it's what anticoagulation is best in that situation. Um, and even on warfarin with renal failure, your risk of bleeding is higher if you've got renal failure. So whatever anticoagulation um, drug you're on, your bleeding risk is higher. So apixaban will go down to the lower GFRs, and that's kind of 
based on the data, and that's because it's less renally excreted. Um, so that gives you slightly more um, efficiency. Not that apixaban is available, but... Um, um, the other drug that I think is really helpful and kind of keeps coming up in a lot of haematology um, uh, conferences is fondoparanox. And, and it's basically, I would use fondoparanox in the kind of situation of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So um, fondoparanox works is a heparin, but it works slightly different in its effect, and it only evacuates 10A, whereas the others are kind of a bit more um, higher spectrum. And the advantage of fondoparanox in the um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia patient is that it's once a day, subcutaneous, it's relatively cheap compared to when you um, look at all the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia drugs out there. Um, we worked out recently that it was $20 a day compared to 200 um, of bivril arudin. Um, so um, it is kind of quite nice in that situation. And there's a reasonable... There's reasonable data coming out that it's probably um, quite safe as well. Um, so this is a study of 195 patients, um, and basically the mortality rates um, were very low in the fondoparanox treatments. It is renal excreted, so you can't really use it in renal impairment, but it is actually a really easy treatment um, compared to using infusions with bivalorubudin. So it's something to kind of probably be in the formery on the pharmacy. Um, it does make your life a lot easier. Um, and just another topic that we got lots of questions about was air travel. And I think that um, looking at our data from the thrombosis in Wellington, we have a higher number of patients who've had thrombosis from travel. And I suspect that's because New Zealand's far away from everywhere and people travel quite a lot. and they travel for quite a number of hours. Um, so um, this is the Canadian guidelines for travel. Um, so any flight over four hours, you have an increased risk of thrombosis. Um, but eight hours, um, they say they're looking at 1.65 cases per million travelers. But I think we had about six or eight thrombosis from travel last year. So I says, and 500,000 population. So I suspect that that's higher in New Zealand, but I don't know. Um, and so we advise general preventative measures. I always tell them to have an aisle seat. There's a reduced risk of thrombosis in an aisle seat because they'll get up and walk. Um, and um, stockings, apparently, stockings in that situation might be helpful. That's kind of, it's hard to do trials in these patients because you have to look at so many patients going flying um, to kind of come up with any evidence. Uh, there's a small randomised control traf um, study looking at heparin versus aspirin, and then they scanned all the patients to see if there's thrombosis, and they um, suspect that aspirin wasn't good in that situation. Um, so, um, so we, I, I would always advocate low molecular weight heparin for patients who, who uh, travel um, over four hours, particularly if they've had a significant thrombotic event. Um, <laughs> It's if they're going, you know, long distance travel, then we'll give them a couple of days of that. Um, using the um, the DERX or the NOAX in that situation, so dimigatran patient, when it's not licensed for that indication, and it, it's kind of um, probably not general practice, although it does look very attractive from taking a pill rather than injection on holiday with you. Um, so. Um, so just a summary of what I've been through and what I think is um, important is um, um, venous thrombosis, um, essentially the history is good in predicting their reoccurrence rate. So a provoked thrombosis versus an unprovoked thrombosis. And so that's what I think is the most key thing in predicting reoccurrence. The DASH score, um, for those patients where you're kind of debating whether to keep them on lifelong anticoagulation is, is helpful. And also, I think we probably need to be introducing risk assessments um, and kind of guidelines into our in-hospital patients. Um, atrial fibrillation and arterial thrombosis. I think it's balancing the CHAD score versus the bleeding risk and, and having that discussion with the patient. Um, specific anticoagulation medication, I mean, 
I haven't done much about warfarin, but I think warfarin is a good drug out there. I wouldn't advocate changing people from warfarin to um, the newer anticoagulants. Um, I think if a patient is well controlled on an anticoagulant, I wouldn't change them for the sake of change. Um, I think that New Zealand has by far the, probably the most experience with dabigatran um, and good experience with a reversal agent. Um, I think the factors included, you know, the renal function is an important <coughs> issue to potentially have other options. And some people are attracted by a once daily medication. So that might make an impact.